Hello there, welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earlier crimes. But before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. This week I am stamping, with Simon Says Stamp Intense Black Ink, the Honeybee Stamps Holiday Blooms Stamp Set. These images are drawn by Kelly Taylor on YouTube. She has Kelly Taylor Cards. I will be doing some masking because I want to make a bunch of blooms. I will be coloring them like this. This is a picture of an amaryllis I found. I like the white in the middle of each petal. So I am going to attempt to recreate that. I am stamping on Nina Classic Crest 80 pound cardstock, solar white color cardstock. Um, I am Copic coloring. I do make a boo-boo with my masking here with the plant pot and the stems, which I will fix um, by strategically hiding it with my sentiment. I, um, I think that's all about the, oh, to color things white, you have to add the shadows. So I'm coloring the plant pot white as well, but it's more like an off white than a true white. So I'm including more shadows than actual color. So now that we've talked about the coloring, let's jump into the crime. <clears throat> Our journey today takes us back to Idaho, the 43rd state to be admitted to the Union on July 3rd, 1890. Idaho has been given the moniker the Gem State because of its abundance of natural resources, including gems, but Idaho has other nicknames as well, including Gem of the Mountains, Land of Famous Potatoes, Little Ida, Potato State, Spud State, and Land, Land of Many Waters, and the Whitewater State. Idaho is the only state whose state seal on the flag was designed by a woman. The word Idaho was claimed by George Willing to be a Shoshone term for Gem of the Mountains. It's not. It's a fake word. Idaho is home of the first alpine chairlift located in Sun Valley. North America's deepest gorge is located in Hills Canyon, Idaho. And Idaho is home to the Shoshone Falls, sometimes called the Niagara of the West. And they are amazing. Craters of the Moon National Monument and Preserve is a dried lava flow. Evil Knievel jumped the Snake River in Twin Falls in 1974. Well, attempted to jump the river and the gorge, but the parachute malfunctioned and the jump was not entirely successful. However, there is a monument to Evil Knievel there in Twin. Idaho has some pretty famous ghost towns. Idaho is home to the longest gondola ride in North America and the longest floating boardwalk. Movies have been made in Idaho, including Napoleon Dynamite. And Idaho, well, Idaho doesn't keep all its secrets buried forever. Eventually, they are unearthed. Joseph Henry Loveless was born on December 3rd, 1870 in Payson, Utah, or in what was then Utah Territory, to Joseph Jackson and Sarah Jane Loveless. Joseph was fifth of their nine children. The Loveless family was well-known and well-liked in their community and in the Payson area. They were considered upstanding members of the community. This community was a community of large families and a community of um, people who intermarried often. So you had a number of people from the Smith family marrying a number of people from the Jones family. And that went on for a couple of generations, which does matter later. However, Joseph he was a little different from the rest of his family. He, um, well, he was less upstanding. Let's put it that way. <laughs> in 1899, Joseph was 28 and he married Harriet Jane or Hattie in Salt Lake City, Utah. And they went on and had one daughter. In 1904, Harriet filed for divorce on the grounds of desertion and failure to provide for a family. She was granted the divorce that same year, and the court records indicate that Joseph never showed up to the court proceedings. In August of 1905, so the next year, Joseph got remarried, and this time he married Agnes Octavia Caldwell, and they were married in Fremont County, Idaho. Between 1906 and 1914, the couple had four children. Now, remember when I said that Joseph was not like his other upstanding community member family or community member, 
Members of the community, family members. There we go. That was an ugly sentence. <laughs> well, Joseph made his career as a bootlegger and was arrested a number of times. In fact, um, he was arrested so many times that he had created aliases. His um, arrests included um, arresting, being arrested for bootlegging and other liquor violations and from escaping from jail. One thing to note is that Fremont County had exercised the dry option law, which made um, Fremont County an alcohol dry county long before federal prohibition laws were in effect. So Joseph could ex was arrested many times and he escaped from jail many times. And he did this by hiding a small saw blade inside his shoe. And he would use that to escape through the jail bars. In 1916, using one of his aliases, Joseph was in police custody and being transported via the train. He convinced the train conductor to stop and attempted to escape from the train. Police apprehended him and put him in jail, and he stayed in jail for a little while before he got out again. But bootlegging and escape isn't what Joseph is best known for. On May 5th, 1916, Agnes Loveless was murdered with an ax in the presence of two of her children. Neighbors reported that they heard a fight coming from the Loveless house the day before her murder. And on May 11th, 1916, an arrest was made. A man known to the police as Walter Carnes was arrested for Agnes's murder. Well, what police did not realize at that moment in time was that Walter Carnes, and he spelled his name a number of different ways, um, was, in fact, Joseph Loveless, who was also known as Charles Smith. So Joseph had records under three names. Police records did eventually line up and confirm the fact that Joseph was Walter and Charles and that he was Agnes's murderer. Another point of information that was discovered was that at the time of his arrest, just a few days after her murder, Joseph had been living in a tent on the outskirts of town. About a week after her death, Agnes' funeral was held on May 16, 1916. Her children were in attendance, and one of their sons was quoted as saying, Papa never stayed in jail very long, and he will soon be out. Sure enough, he was. On May 18, 1916, once again, Joseph escaped from jail by sawing through the bars of his cell with a small blade he had hid inside his shoe, while his prison guards were out eating their supper. The police did not find Joseph after his last escape from the St. Anthony, Idaho jail. In fact, Joseph was never seen alive again. His final wanted poster, which was released, um, he was wanted for jailbreak and you know murdering his wife, but it describes him as wearing a light colored hat, brown coat, red maroon sweater, and blue overalls over thick black trousers. They did not describe his physical appearance in this, want this wanted poster, which I find curious. Now, if you're new to my channel and you've not heard me tell stories before, you're probably going, what's the big deal? There is nothing exciting about this story. It's like every other or a million other Wild West stories with no ending. But if you've been here before, if you've heard me tell other stories, you know there's a twist. And let me tell you, it is the kind that good stories are made from. But we're going to jump forward to August 26th of 1979. Um, sheriff, or retired Sheriff Earl Holden from Fairmont County was contacted when... The torso of a man was discovered buried in a shallow 18 inch deep grave by a family exploring Buffalo Cave. Buffalo Cave is part of the civil defense cave system. Um, the Clark County Sheriff's deputies searched in and around the area with a metal detector 
but didn't find anything else. The medical ca um, county medical examiner at the time believed that the remains had been there 10 years or less due to their condition. The torso was wearing a red sweater, which was noted to be in good shape. Police could not identify the remains, and he became, or this torso became known as Buffalo Cave John Doe. Jump forward some more to 1991. There's an 11-year-old girl looking for arrowheads in, Buffalo, in the Buffalo Cave area, and she discovers limbs, you know, hands, feet, arms, legs, limbs of an unidentified person in a burlap sack sticking out of the cave floor. Idaho State University's anthropology department was called in to try to learn of any further news about this new discovery. Could they figure anything else out about the limbs? Then a DNA profile matched the hands, the limbs, to the torso that had been discovered 13 years before. Idaho Museum of Natural History and in conjunction with the Idaho State University conducted a dig of the area, but they didn't find anything else. Fast forward a few more years to 2007. There's an anthropology student named Florence Dickens who wrote an extensive report about these uncovered remains. And in fact, between 2008 and 2010, she went with cadaver dogs to Buffalo Cave in an attempt to unearth any further remains or clues. Um, jumping forward again to 2015, there were some professors from, the, from Idaho State University's anthropology, anthropology department, and they actually went back to Buffalo Cave and undertook an extensive in-depth excavation, including a scan of the cave system. In 2017, Idaho State University's anthropology department submitted a bone sample taken from the femur of the, you know, the bag of limbs to a DNA, uh, um, to DNA Solutions, that's a company, for analysis. Now, this, um, DNA analysis was developed and it was sent for sequencing and then investigators submitted that DNA sequence to CODIS, NamUs, and NDIS, all databases, in an attempt to discover a possible genetic match. Now keep in mind, they think the torso has been there for 10 years or less when it was first discovered. Okay. Huh. In March of 2019, Idaho State University professors reached out to the DNA Doe Project. This is a project that uses DNA to identify unidentified people. And they um, submitted the case and the DNA profile that they got from the remains identified them as belonging to a male with reddish or brown hair who was between five feet, five inches and six foot one inch with an estimated age of between 18 and 45 and was believed to be of European ancestry. His specific cause of death could not be determined, but the anthropologist believed he had likely been dismembered post-mortem due to the fact that his dismembered limbs were discovered in a burlap sack. That would have made it easier to move the dead body to the cave after having been killed in another location. They also found other evidence of tool marks on the remains and that they surmised happened during dismemberment. Okay. The investigators, police investigators and an analysis determined that this was, in fact, a homicide. Now, um, Anthony Redgrave, I had to look up the name, was the case manager and team leader for this DNA Doe project. 
And he gave a statement that it took 14 volunteer genetic genealogists, that's an actual job or um, hobby, 15 weeks and over 2,000 combined hours before they could even pos um, select a possible family group for the DNA sequence they had extracted. And then they were able to uncover, uncover sorry, several thousand possible links. And this goes back to what I said before at the very beginning, how the Loveless family lived in a small com community that was um, populated by large families who often intermarried. So you have the Smiths, the Joneses, and the, I don't know, the Lovelaces, all marrying each other's couple of, um, siblings and cousins and aunts and uncles. And because of the repeated intermarrying that was going on in this community, um, it made it really hard to narrow down um, the DNA sequence. However, they eventually narrowed down the results to 250 DNA matches in this large family lineage that they traced back to Payson, Utah. Of those 250 matches, there were over 31,000 individuals that made up these specific degrees or pedigrees rather of this family tree. And again, it's like a bush, not a tree, because aunts and cousins and uncles and stuff from each of these families were marrying each other. So the DNA profile was also sent to Dr. Gregory Magoon, um, and he developed a, a sequence and then uploaded it to GenMatch, which is another, it's like DNA, um, it's another genealogical um, DNA website kind of thing. And it took... 48 hours just to upload the sequence. And then on November 5th, the DNA, um, 2017, the DNA Doe Project submitted a preliminary report outlining a possible identity of the body parts found in Buffalo Cave. The Clark County Sheriff's Office discovered an 87-year-old living grandson that resided in California who had submitted a DNA sample to be used for direct DNA comparison to the victim of these discovered body parts. The remains discovered in Buffalo Cave were positively identified as... I know you're super surprised now. Joseph Henry Loveless. By a separation of three generations from Joseph and the living grandson. Another shocking discovery was the fact that the environment and the conditions of the cave added to the extensive preservation of the remains, meaning that the 10-year timeline originally attached to the um, torso was incorrect. They'd been there for the whole time. Uh, yeah, holy cow. And here is more to add to this mystery. Joseph had a headstone in the family plot in the Payson City Cemetery in Payson, Utah. But when investigators contacted the cemetery, um, well, A, there's no death date on his gravestone. And the cemetery staff said there was no interment date listed for Joseph in the records and that his gravesite did not contain any remains. Case investigators were not able to actually ever find a picture of Joseph. So they took and made a deposit based on photographs of his direct lineage and descriptions gathered from other historical documents. 
Researchers also used the original wanted poster or the last wanted poster to uncover some of his characteristics. And remember that one poster described him as wearing blue ribbed overalls and a red sweater and black pants or, you know, kind of, I'm paraphrasing here. The remains found in Buffalo Cave were dressed in a white shirt with blue pinstripes under a maroon colored sweater, dark colored pants. The similarities have led investigators to believe that Joseph was murdered, dismembered, and hidden in Buffalo Cave shortly after his escape from jail. But who did it? The case is considered an open case by investigators. 100 years after Joseph disappeared, remains were identified as his. And it is appearing through the DNA studies and anthropologists and stuff that he probably died around 1916 at the age of 46, like right after he got out of jail. And, and who put the grave marker in the family plot in the cemetery without a death date? Like, how did they know he was dead? Y'all, so many questions. Let's start with, how did the dude keep getting out of jail and why did they never check his shoe? I mean, come on. If he's this kind of, they're looking at the bars, they're seeing their sod, why is nobody checking him for saw blades? Okay, that's the first question. The next question is, um, why? Why would he kill his wife? And why would he do it in front of their children? I'm not saying he didn't do it. I'm just saying why. That's like he went off the bend all the way off the bend. Um, but when he got out of jail, where did he go? Who killed him? Because he he went somewhere. He ran into somebody. They're, they're not saying his body was torn apart by wolves. He went somewhere and had contact with someone who um, ended him. Let's just call it that. They murdered him. Now, I suppose, in theory, it could have been an accidental death and the person he was with did not want to be attached to him and his crimes in any way. And so then he was dismembered and buried and hidden. But um, wouldn't it have been easier just to walk away from the accidental death location and um, let him be found? I don't know. It. I'm. I'm going with murder, and I want to know who did it. <laughs> I mean, that's just my brain. I'm like, who was mad enough at him, not only to kill him? That part I get because he killed his children's wife. He killed somebody's daughter. He murdered a person. I understand somebody may have been mad enough to kill him, but who was mad enough to kill him and then, you know, package him up in separate packages and bury him and then put a grave marker in the cemetery? I don't know. I think the person who put the grave marker in was the person who killed him or at least knew that he was dead, knew of his death. That That's, they had to, right? So. Here is a picture of what Joseph looked like based on descriptions and photographs from family members. I also found a picture of his first wife, Harriet. And um, yeah, Harriet was her name. <laughs> Took me a minute to get them in order. And I found a picture of his second wife, wife, Agnes, who also was married before she married Joseph to like a boxer. So if that's not weird enough for you. And there is a picture of a newspaper clipping of when he escaped from prison after his wife's murder. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I hope you enjoyed the story. I have a couple of other videos here I think you might like as well. I've also added a subscribe button. If you haven't subscribed yet, I would love it if you did. Leave me a comment down below. Tell me who you think did it or what is going on. Leave me a thumbs up and have a really fabulous day.